what do you want to do with your life? Where do you want to be in 10 years? And it's okay if you're not going to be here. I get it. Yep. And they say, oh, I want to start my own business. Then if they do something that is um, not a great executive decision, I go into them and I say, you know, you want to start your own business. Business owners end up on budget and they end up on time. And so if you really want to own your business, you got to start here by being on budget and on time so that when you do own your own business, you're already trained for that. So today on Sea Level, I have Jamie Turner, author, speaker, and professor. Jamie, welcome. Hey, I am glad to be here. Thanks for having me on board. I can't wait to dive into some interesting stuff about whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I know I know you've got two, two areas of expertise, marketing and leadership. We might touch on both. I'm really interested in, in talking about some of the new things you're talking about as far as the leadership angle. But let me get some history on you. Uh, give me your background. How'd you get into this? I know you're Atlanta native like I am. So uh, let's jump into it. I am in Atlanta now. I actually was born in London. You wouldn't know that from my accent, but came over early on, started my career in New York City in marketing and advertising, then came down to Atlanta. Yeah. Probably about 12 years ago now, I went to my employer, said, can I start a blog on behalf of your company? And they said, yeah, we've heard about those things. And the <laughs> blog kind of took off and got a global following. That's good news for me uh, because it kind of got me on people's radar screens. Unfortunately for the company, it was designed to generate leads for that company, and it wasn't really doing a good job at that, to be honest. It was more uh, thought leadership and less lead generation. So I ultimately went to them and said, uh, hey, if it's okay with you, I'd like to take this thing and run with it. And they said, great, you know, we loved having you on board and all that sort of stuff. And so for the past decade, I've been doing this on my own. And it ranges from everything from a little bit of consulting to speaking around the globe while there was speaking. Um, that'll come back. Change, and, change now. Yeah, it has changed a little bit, but, uh, but I think that'll ev eventually come, in back, come back. And then also teaching uh, down at uh, Emory University as well as the University of Texas. So it's been been a blast, lots of great things to do and a lot of learning I continue to learn to this day. So now uh, on your consulting, are you consulting with other CEOs? And tell me a little bit about that, that side. Yeah, it's primarily, here, here's a, a, the interesting thing about that. I love getting on stage and speaking because I get to share my wisdom. So if I had a choice, it'd be 100% speaking. However, um, because, and the reason for that is when you speak, you, you kind of have something, your, your job is to engage the audience and inspire them. When you consult, you actually have to do some work. And so it's very difficult. You gotta go in and you know get to the meat of the issue and figure things out. The cool thing is, is that when you're at my stage of the game, you've kind of stepped on every landmine that's out there. You've made every mistake. So it actually, to my great surprise, has been easier than I thought, which, I, which is, I go in and I work with companies and they say, we're trying to figure out if we should turn left at this juncture or turn right. And I'm like, you can go left, but let me tell you how that ends and it doesn't end well, go right instead. To them, that's valuable. To me, it's just based on all these years of experience. And so it's been a, it's actually been a blast. I've been really surprised at how much fun consulting has been. I, I there's, there's a little nugget that was in everything that you just said there is that you made a lot of mistakes and, and there are some young entrepreneurs, some young business owners that think they have to have everything all figured out. The fact that we've all made mistakes and we learn from it, and that's what makes you better at what you do. And, and, and you're able to get to a point like you are, where you can get up on stage and then speak because you've experienced all the pitfalls, you experienced all the hurdles, so you're able to provide more value because you went through some of those setbacks. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, they say that you learn more from your failures than you do from your successes. And that's definitely true. In fact, in, in Silicon Valley, they want people, the VC community is saying, we actually want to bring people on board who have failed because they've learned lessons. They have humility, which is a very powerful lesson and an important one. Um, and then also the, the, the other thing is that you, you end up really realizing as you grow older that Life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And it's not, a, you know, I remember being in my 20s and I'd have a setback and I'd be like, oh, this is the end of the world. And <laughs> I, yeah, and my father used to come to me and say, 
when you're young, it feels like the end of the world. When you're older, you realize everybody steps on a ton of landmines during their career and you just got to kind of move forward and get past it. I think that's the biggest piece too, is like, if you can learn to enjoy your setbacks as much as your wins yeah. or your setbacks, you're, you're, you're going to live a, a much happier life. It's just, it's part of life. Things are going to happen. Like there's, you know, we're going through a very major situation right now. Yeah. No one predicted any of this happened. There's a lot of people that, that are hurting right now, but we're going to get through this. And, 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 you know, you, you got to find the, find the areas of enjoyment to keep carrying you through. And I think that's, that's the key to all this. Yeah. There's a great story around that. And it's a legend of a King who's being attacked. He leaves his country because he's lost the battles. He meets an old man. The old man gives him a locket and he says, read the locket. And the, the King opens up the locket and it says, this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. And the king said, okay, I get it. Now I understand that this bad period shall pass and I'll get past it. Fast forward five years later, the king has come back. He's now the ruler again. Things are going great. And he sees the old man and the old man goes up to him and says, read the locket. And the king says, no, 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 no. That was from before. He says, read it again. He opens it and it says, this too shall pass. And it's a great way to help you understand that when you're at your peak, you're not such a hot shot. And when you're at bottom, you're not really such a loser. It's, it's all about perspective. And I keep reminding myself of that during the good times. This too shall pass. And then I go, okay, this is temporary. It's great. Loving it. Having a great time. But I just need to remember that. And that kind of, that kind of balance between the two is an important thing, I think, for all leaders. I, I love working with leaders that understand that philosophy because, you know, I, I'm around a lot of other successful people and there, there are, and, and it's crazy as it sounds, but there are some people that are still having success. There are some certain industries that are, are, are even thriving during this. And it's, it's hard to believe, but they even understand that this they're, they're even keel, right? It's like, this could end tomorrow it's it, this this will pass as you mentioned and and so i love working with leaders that that you know can go through the valleys and the peaks and still be level headed i think that's that's a good key to leadership you know i met uh i worked for some people two people uh named brent and maribet and they both were the c suite people in the company founders and all that one thing i noticed about them was this sense of humility. And I realized that's what great leaders actually have is this sense of humility despite their successes. And I often talk about that because I think we have sometimes been led to believe in particular in the United States that the more brash you are, the more outrageous you are, the louder you are, the more arrogant you are, the more successful you'll be. And the reality is that doesn't happen. What the, the most successful leaders are the ones who are, remain humble despite success or despite failures. And it's a real interesting balance there. Yeah. I, I, servant leadership too, I think is another, another piece is like, how can you serve other people uh, to help them succeed? You know, taking your, the focus off of you and, and doing that. I've seen a lot of leaders and, and to your point, you know, back I mean, I guess back in the eighties and it was, it was very like dominating like leadership type stuff. And, and I just, I don't, I don't believe that that's the way it is anymore. And that's the way it should be. I think like to your point, it's like a secret weapon, you know, it's like, these are what leaders possess. Um, there's a couple of the things that you talk about. You hit on a good point. Um, the unspoken rules of leadership. So there's four pillars to this. Can, can you kind of elaborate on it? Cause I was, I was kind of doing some yeah. research on here from you. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that, that for those of you who are listening, it's a matrix I've developed that shows the four pillars of leadership. I'll come back to that in a second. But basically, I went in and did a speech with a bunch of tips about leadership. And I came off the stage, everybody's walking up. Oh, that was great. Oh, that was great. And one guy came up to me and he said, loved it, thought it was brilliant, loved the tips. I thought you were going to show a framework for how these tips are relevant in business. I thought that's actually a very good idea. So I sat down literally at a Waffle House one morning, sketched it out on a napkin. And the framework is basically um, things that you tell yourself, things that you tell others and uh, various things like that. And they come down to four pillars. 
mindset, which I'll come back to in a second, one of my favorite topics. The second pillar is uh, mentoring, which is when you're talking to somebody else and mentoring them. The third pillar is management, when you're talking to your team, not one-on-one, -on -one, but a team. And then marketing, which is where you're talking to large groups, maybe your whole company or even your customers. And so I put all these tips into the, that category and called it the unspoken rules of leadership because these are the tips that you don't read about in textbooks when you're in college. These are the kinds of things that you kind of learn through experience or a mentor will tell you. The first being on the mindset pillar is the idea that great leaders work on their mindset first and their skill sets second. And a lot of times people think, oh, I got to work on my skills. I got to work on my skills. And the actual truth is what you have to work on is how you think because your thoughts lead to your actions and your actions lead to your life. And so if you understand that what I think ultimately becomes my reality, then you can start diving in and making sure your thoughts are correct, proper, clear, you know, pure, all of that stuff, because it adds up over time. So anyway, that's the first M in there. And it's one of my favorite things, because I'm sure, Chris, you do that. You probably yeah. work on mindset an awful lot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You have to. You have to, because there, there's... I think there's there's pieces of it that follows through our life, right? So there's childhood, right? So there's a lot of things that we take on as individuals through our childhood and we bring it into our adulthood. We call I call it head trash, right? Mm -hmm. And so oh, yeah. so there are, you know, going through school, school's very tough sometimes. Like I had a crazy tough time in school. Um, and so there's a lot of head trash from that. And when you can learn as a leader to shed that, to get rid of that head trash, you are able to make better clearer decisions understanding understanding yourself is the is the biggest key to all this is is you know making you know reading books and 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 uh, you know I, I don't know if you're a big fan of like you know the myers briggs and all, all these other like uh tests that you can take to kind of identify um you know who you are as a leader because that knowing yourself is 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 the name of the game especially in a position of leadership no, I totally agree. Self-awareness is it. And you just referenced, you know, hey, you struggle a little bit in school. So did I. And I've done quite well for myself. And part of it is because in, I had ADHD. I could not yeah. retain. Same here. <laughs> Enjoy the yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just couldn't retain things. I would read a paragraph in college and I'd be like, I just have no clue what that paragraph says. I'd yep. be bouncing around. And ultimately, I got into meditation. So meditation with a T, not medication, but not that there's anything wrong with medication for certain things, but meditation and I do transcendental meditation and it was a game changer for me. I went into a doctor when I was in my mid thirties. I said, I got ADHD. I need to get on Ritalin. And again, whatever path people want to take is fine. But this doctor said, you know, you don't necessarily want to be on a med medication the rest of your life. Do you meditate? I actually had meditated plenty. And he said, I want you to shift to twice a day and do it. And so now I try to hit twice a day. Probably most days I hit twice a day but it was a game changer for me. My, my clarity of thought improved, my memory improved, my ability to hold other people's attention improved because I wasn't bouncing off the walls. And it was a game changer for me. So Chris, it goes back to what you said, self-awareness is what kind of helps you navigate through things because you're aware of who you are and how you interact with the world. And if you can make adjustments or learn from things that go, you know, that aren't exactly perfect, like having ADHD and trying to get through reams of textbooks, then you can sort of navigate your way through and have success on the other side of it. Yeah, it's uh, and and dealing with with those types of things, it it does it's difficult because your mind is constantly going, you're constantly thinking of things. And I do I do, I have actually found that micro meditation, something I just recently I've learned, is that you really only have to take a couple of minutes. It doesn't have to be this long hour, hour meditation, but if you're doing that throughout the day, you know, it could be something as simple as, you know, just putting your hand on the desk, you know, and, and just feeling the warmth of it or, you know, mm -hmm. like, or whatever, right. You just, the texture of your pen and just focusing on, you know, getting your mind focused, quieting your mind down, you know, I find, find helps me a lot because that's the way I'm wired. My, my no, head it, going it, anywhere. I, I would, uh, uh, yes. And the um, argument for shorter meditation, I'm a fan of that, is for me, 
is if I get into the alpha state, then if I can get into the alpha state, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, within the first few minutes, as long as I hit that state, I don't have to meditate the 15 or 20 or 25 minutes that I do. The alpha state, for those of you listening, is, is, is the state of feeling totally connected to the universe um, and at peace and at one with everything. And that can be very nuanced and very subtle when you first experience it. But I have found that my brain goes from the monkey chatter and switches over to the calm and peacefulness once I hit the alpha state. And by the way, the alpha state kind of happens in the forehead. It's in the front part of your brain, right between your eyes, above, above your eyes and, 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 and on your nose. And there's this, that's where the executive reasoning part of your brain is. And if you can focus attention, energy, blood flow, everything to that part of your brain, it moves it out of the reptilian brain, which is in the back and the base of your skull. And that's where our instincts are and moves it more to the front where our, our executive reasoning is and our forethought and our planning and our calm. And that all happens at the front part of the brain. So if you remember that as you're meditating, it helps, it helps kind of bring that to the forefront and hopefully will help some of the listeners kind of get into meditation. Cause I got to tell you, it was a game changer for me. So good. Such great information. I mean, I, I know we, we're coming up on our, on our, on our time here, but um, I mean, cause I could talk, we can talk for hours on this, but I, one, if there's, there's a lot of things going into 2021. And so if there was um, advice that you would give to leaders moving forward into 2021, one piece of advice, what would that be? Yeah, it would be to think win-win. And I know it's a little bit of a cliche, but it's true. If you can enter in, Chris, you mentioned a few minutes ago when you are, um, uh, you know, when you go in and, and try to work with somebody's uh, self-interest, you use different phraseology. But what I was thinking about was when you mentor somebody and you're trying to guide them towards a better outcome, whether it's your business and all that sort of stuff, whoever you're mentoring, if you understand what their goals are, what they want in their life, and then weave your goals into their goals, then the outcome is better. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have an employee, they missed a deadline uh, and they were over budget on something. If you know that that employee wants to start their own business someday, because when I hire people, I always say, what do you want to do with your life? Where do you want to be in 10 years? And it's okay if you're not going to be here. I get it. Yep. And they say, oh, I want to start my own business. Then if they do something that is um, not a great executive decision, I go into them and I say, you know, you want to start your own business. Business owners end up on budget and they end up on time. And so if you really want to own your business, you got to start here by being on budget and on time so that when you do own your own business, you're already trained for that. That's a win-win coaching mechanism that helps them go, oh, I get that. Okay, I'm in. And suddenly it's a win-win going back to your question. It's a win-win engagement. I need you to be on time. You want to learn how to do that. Let's do that together and we'll uh, grow as a result. And so anyway, long story short, is a win-win engagement in 2021, I think is... Um, is important. Let me just say one last thing also is forgiveness. And, and, and because we've come through a very, very difficult period uh, in particular in the last few weeks. And it's tempting to say, I told you so. I said all along this would happen. I said this, I said this, I said, and believe me, I want to say that to a lot of my friends. My lovely wife has said, don't do that. People need to heal and they need to come to their own conclusions. And all you do when you shame people is make them steal their point of view, make them hold tight to what they said previously. And if you let them just go and come out of it peacefully and reflect peacefully without shame and without being told, I told you so, they will be better for it and our country will be better for it. So that's another thing that I would suggest people to do is forgive. Don't forget, but forgive and move on. I love that. So when mentoring people, figure out what their ultimate goal is. Take, take, the, the, take it off of you, focus on them, figure out what their goal is. And then as you're coaching them in your company, if they do something that doesn't align with their goal, their ultimate goal, bring it up to their attention. Uh, and, and this way it makes them, it makes them better in, in the working environment that you have working, working for you, but also it's preparing them for their ultimate goal. And again, have forgiveness uh, in the future. I love this really good information, Jamie. Thanks for coming on today's episode. 
Chris, thanks for having me. I uh, look forward to doing this again. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, make sure you mash that like button and subscribe so you get the latest episodes. And if somebody else needs to hear it, please do them that favor and share it. To learn more about Jamie Turner, visit jamieturner.live.